Chris, how you doing, brother? Hey, Zach. Nice to nice to see you. Um, okay, so I got to ask. I, I I watched the Snyder Cut this weekend, and I I really did love it. Like legitimately, I thought it was amazing. And I got to ask you because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how long the movie was supposed to be when you were doing it for Warner Brothers originally. Because sure. watch, watching the four hour version, I felt like nothing could have really been cut though, because it felt like it's like how could it have ever been a two hour movie? Yeah. Um... I don't know how it ever could have been a two hour movie. I'll be honest with you. I, that was um, a big problem that we were working on. I thought, I thought we were going to look land probably with a lot of cuts and, you know, the movie getting choked pretty hard at around two forty. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, that was not in the cards, as they say, mm-hmm. destiny, destiny had other things um, in mind for us. So, because it's, yeah. it's it's it would have been I don't know I I I feel like if, if a three hour version had gone out people would have really been into it because it's almost like Lord of the Rings you know with all the Amazon mythology and stuff and when you cut that out it would be like cutting all the mythology out of that you know like all the fantasy out of the film it doesn't make any sense to me that that would have ever gone out as two hours it's strange yeah I you and I would have the same attitude on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then the other question I have for you is you talked once about how the studio rejected a couple of your ideas for being too scary. Were there any that you were able to put back into the movie because it felt significantly darker than than anything in the in the in the Justice League version that came out? I mean the only, the only thing I wasn't able to restore that I wanted to I just couldn't I couldn't do it and it's fine. I, I have no no regrets as they say. Uh, that was the cocoons, you know. That the mm-hmm. that the the parademons would cocoon you, mm-hmm. a la aliens, and you would like in that cocoon you would be like transformed into a parademon. Oh wow, jeez! That so that really was cool. a cool that was a cool kind of idea that I had. Um, and when they go originally, when they went into the um, tunnel battle, they found all the scientists like half turned and oh wow, and like, yeah, and they were like, no, 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 not. Wow. Cool. Oh, that, that, that sucks then because that would have been really cool. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so, but other yeah. than that, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've done, even just with like Steppenwolf fighting and Steppenwolf himself clearly uh, is more of an R-rated character yeah. than say the Steppenwolf that you saw mm-hmm. maybe in the theatrical version. Well, um, yeah, he's scary. Um, I have to ask you as, as a fan, you know, with the, with the nightmare stuff that everybody's talking about, which is yeah. great. I, I do feel like in a way, I know that you've said that you're not necessarily intending this, but I do feel that you've kind of left the door open to some degree. Would you say that I'm off base at all or? Well, I mean, only in the sense that like the movie was designed as a cliffhanger, you know, the, yeah. that, that is the design of the film, you know, like Lex is telling uh, Deathstroke Bruce Wayne's name. Like these are things that are um, inevitably going to lead to other things happening. Um, and that was the way the movie we were, we had designed like two more movies after this. There's a look, in my opinion, this could be the only version of uh, my version of justice. I mean, this could be the last movie for sure. Right now it is the last movie. Um, and, and I just wanted to give the fans as a complete experience as possible in regard to like, um, the genre trope of the superhero movie at its best is this kind of promise of things to come. So that's well, fine. That's I want, I want to see it. I think everybody's going to want to see it after this comes out. So hopefully we'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Okay. Cheers. So hi, nice to meet you. Um, okay. Nice so I think you, Chris. I think one of the questions that everybody has about the Snyder Cut, well, or, or Zack Snyder's Justice League, I guess, is that people want to know who approached whom, I think. Was it the studio that approached you guys? Or were you guys that approached the studio? So it was right after the two-year anniversary of the theatrical release. And I, I remember distinctly, it was like 6.30 in the morning, and we got a call from our agent and he said, are you guys sitting down? And we go, yeah, it's kind of early. Is everything okay? And he goes, well, I just got a call um, from the studio and they want to know if you want to put your cut on HBO Max. And um, we were like floored because we knew, you know, we had seen what the fans were doing and it was getting bigger and bigger, but still the reality of like 
that happening was something entirely different. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, we don't have any money, so you have to put it up as a rough cut. And we were like, well, I don't know. And they said, well, well, what would it take? You know, and, and there was that question, well, what would it take? And it, that was quite a process that took several months to figure out because we had a cut of the movie that we had kind of, when we left the movie, we took with us, but it, it was not done. It was in like disarray. It was a full cut, but there was no music. So we had to figure out and also figure out in secret because we didn't want word to get out. Yeah. And then there'd be a lot of disappointed fans. So we did a lot of work and, and figured out, okay, this is what it would take to get it done. And we then showed them the movie. They came to our screening room and they got to see the cut of Justice League. It was in black and white because like some of it was storyboard, some of it was pre -vis, some of it was visual effects shots. And uh, they sat through it. And I think they were amazed because no one had ever seen that, that version of the film before because it was not going to be a reality. It was four hour, you know, it was under four hours, but it wasn't really a reality that that would come to life. And finally, after seeing that and seeing our plan, they said, well, can you get it done by March? And we were like, oh, yes, we can. And um, that's how, you know, it eventually got made. Did the pandemic help with the situation or did it, did it actually hinder the situation? I actually, I think it helped because one, you know, all the shooting went down for a time. So there wasn't a lot of content being generated. And we had the majority of, I mean, we only shot like one scene and one pickup. You know, we shot for three days. Um, so everything was done in post and everything could be done virtually. So even our music was done, like we would pipe in on the iPad and see, the, <laughs> see them um, doing the music and, and the orchestra had to be separated and, um, it was a little bit more challenging in the process of getting it made, but I think it helped get us made because also the visual effects companies, um, the movies they were working on went down. So they yeah. had, you know, all, a lot of artists available that we were able to, you know, get to work. Is there a future perhaps for the, the continuity that we're seeing now kind of established by Justice League? I think everybody's going to hope that there is at the end. <laughs> I think that Warner Brothers, um, has kind of moved on from where we left. I mean, this is an older film for them. And I know that they're on a trajectory. They have a lot of films in development. And I think for us, we're just kind of taking a deep breath and like, I can't believe that we're here at this moment. So it's nice to kind of relish the moment. Um, and, you know, I think that's what we're fo focused on right now. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. When I visited the set of Justice League way back in 2016, I had no idea what a rocky road this film was facing. I vividly remember visiting the London soundstage where it was being shot, meeting the cast and chatting with director Zack Snyder about his epic vision for what DC hoped at the time would be their answer to the Avengers. Little did I know their obsession with making it exactly like the Avengers would lead to Snyder's eventual dismissal from the project with Joss Whedon being brought in to finish the film, which eventually came out in the fall of 2017 to pretty terrible reviews and middling box office. In the years following, rumors started to spread that Snyder had actually delivered a fully realized alternate version of the film long before Whedon got involved, one that was so dark that it spooked the studio. Thus, the myth of the Snyder Cut was born, and when HBO Max announced Snyder was going to finish his mythical cut, people were stunned. Eyebrows were also raised when it was revealed that Warner Brothers would be ponying up no less than $70 million to finish the film, which would be R-rated and run four hours long. The runtime was especially stunning, as the finished theatrical version of the film ran just under two. No one was more of a doubting Thomas than me, as I assumed Snyder had originally been aiming for a two-hour movie, and now we would be getting a crazy crazy bloated rough cut, but how very, very wrong I was. Watching the Snyder Cut, or as it's now officially called, Zack Snyder's Justice League, my jaw was on the floor. This is no bloated extended version. It's an epic superhero team up that's startlingly original, hugely influenced by Jack Kirby's work and somewhat akin to a DC version of Lord of the Rings. 
The Whedon cut, for what it is, has almost nothing in common with Snyder's version. Maybe something like 40 minutes of what Snyder originally shot ended up in the Joss Whedon cut, but even the footage that he used had very little resemblance to the original. Take for example Wonder Woman's first big action scene where terrorists try to set off a bomb in a bank. In the Whedon version, they crack wise and it's relatively lighthearted despite the high stakes. In the Snyder version, it's gruesome and intense, a lot like the opening bank robbery in The Dark Knight and the baddies machine gun bank employees. Wonder Woman's reaction to them is appropriately violent and deadly. And this, no doubt, is going to divide fans, but it's startlingly bold and very Zack Snyder. The vast, vast majority of this film is unseen footage. Over three hours of the film is unseen footage, let's be honest. And it gives the movie an epic scope that's striking. While the basic plot is similar, being that Steppenwolf, as voiced by Kieran Hines, wants to assemble the three mother boxes to pave the way for Darkseid to kill the planet, the two films have very little in common. Steppenwolf's look has been changed, making him much more of a Lovecraft-looking baddie, with a strong plot that hints at him being an exhausted character, desperate to break free from his own enslavement to Darkseid. The League themselves don't assemble until much later in the film, with a full three chapters of the six chapter film passing by the time the now assembled Batman, Flash, Wonder Woman, and Cyborg meet with J.K. Simmons' Commissioner Gordon on the rooftop, something which takes place a whole two hours into the film. The first half of the movie spends a lot of time amongst the Amazons, with Connie Nielsen's Hippolyta having a greatly enhanced role. It makes the whole ordeal much more of a journey for Wonder Woman, with Gal Gadot getting a lot more to do here than she did in Wonder Woman 1984, as basically the Amazons have been decimated to try to save the mother box. Wonder Woman wants revenge. She's fully powered and not preoccupied with Chris Pine's Steve Trevor this time. The other character who emerges much more fully formed is Ray Fisher's cyborg, who in essence the whole film hinges on. He was a nothing character in the Whedon cut, but here he's basically the lead. Henry Cavill's Superman with his black suit is also much darker and refreshingly free of a CGI'd out super stash. Ezra Miller's The Flash comes into focus here with a lot more screen time, with Kiersey Clemens showing up as Iris West in a cool scene, as well as Billy Credup as his imprisoned dad. Joe Morton, who was barely in the Joss Whedon version as Silas Stone, is nearly a lead in this version of the movie. Probably the two characters who were left the most intact in the Whedon cut were Ben Affleck as Batman and Jason Momoa as Aquaman, but there's still some key differences here between the two movies. Momoa's Arthur Curry emerges as a much more serious character, even than he does in James Wan's Aquaman. Well, Affleck's Batman gets all the new material in the much-hyped nightmare sequence, which ends the film on a huge cliffhanger fans will be desperate to see resolved. Something interesting too, Amber Heard shows up as Mira a few times in this film with a British accent, and I think that was the original concept of the character. Really, I'm actually quite stunned by the Snyder Cut. In my wildest dreams, I really never knew it would be this different. Now, in regards to the R rating, the film actually does kind of deserve it. I think it probably could have squeezed by with a PG-13, but it's definitely not for kids. And yes, there's a couple of F-bombs, but they're tastefully used. I think there's two in the entire movie. One from Cyborg and one from Batman during the nightmare sequence. The thing is, people like to give Zack Snyder a hard time because his take on comic books is pretty dark. I don't know why, but there seems to be this vibe that comic book movies should always be family friendly. And the fact is, you know, we all read comic books as kids, but when we grow into adults, we don't always give up on comic books. When we're adults, our tastes change, but a lot of us still like comic books, and there's nothing wrong with doing a slightly more adult superhero movie, a superhero movie for adults. Now, of course, this probably wouldn't have paid off financially for the studio because Batman v Superman, as successful as it was, still didn't really gross the amount of money that Warner Brothers was hoping. I know that they wanted the movie to break a billion dollars, and to be quite honest, Justice League in its form that it is now probably wouldn't have been a huge hit. But artistically, it's a much more satisfying film, and I think that when fans get a look at it and get a look at what they missed, they're going to be blown away. Snyder Cut aficionados and the people that have been hyping up for a long time really are in store for a major shock, and it's pretty impressive that they willed this movie into existence. It's so, so, so much better than the Joss Whedon version, and I think it's actually probably my favorite DCEU movie so far. Everything about it is just so much better, especially the score by Junkie XL. Danny Elfman did the score for the Joss Whedon version of Justice League, but it was not his best work. Junkie XL is working at full force here, and it's just about as good a score as 
as the one that we got in Batman v Superman, with all the classic Superman themes from Man of Steel working their way into the film. It's really impressive. Now the look of the film is probably going to upset a few people, or at least prove to be controversial, because the whole movie is presented in a 144 to 1 aspect ratio, which is the size of an IMAX screen. I'm sure that there's going to be a theatrical release of this on IMAX screens, and it's going to be unbelievable in scope, I'm sure. I think that Whedon probably shot himself in the foot a little bit by not reformatting it for TVs. I think he probably could have done it relatively easily, but it has to be said, it does give the film a really unique look and it's quite striking. Notably, the color timing is totally different in this film. The Joss Whedon version of Justice League opted for that orange and teal look that was all the rage a few years ago. This is much more desaturated and in line with Snyder's work on Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. It has kind of that Terrence Malick meets DC vibe that we all really liked in Man of Steel or at least I really liked. At four hours, I was shocked that the Snyder Cut goes by as quickly as it does, and I really did not anticipate to like it nearly as much as I did. Here's an example. My partner, she's been mocking the Snyder Cut the whole way through just because she hears me talking about it all the time on the podcast, on the Beard and the Bald, or I'm talking about it with the boss when we're doing Joe Blow material and coverage of the Snyder Cut. And to be honest, we've been running Snyder Cut material nonstop. So, you know, we, we make fun of it, and I talk about how sick I am of writing about the Snyder Cut, and it goes back and forth. And when the link came in, we were kind of, you know, teasing each other, saying, oh, it's going to be self-indulgent and this and that. We put it on the other night, watched it all the way through, and both of us looked at each other stunned at how good it was. Like, it really was that good. And even Laura, you know, God bless her, thought it was amazing, thought it was one of the best versions of Wonder Woman that she'd ever seen. And Zack Snyder, I mean, he proves his critics crazy wrong in this movie and i'm sure that there's going to be a lot of other bloggers and writers and critics from other sites that are going to come out against this but i have to say if you're into snyder and his version of the dceu this movie is as good as it's going to get it's amazing i loved it and i'm absolutely stunned to give it a 9 on 10 because i did not expect that at all and please please hbo max and Warner brothers let Snyder finish the nightmare that he's teeing up at the end of this film because it's so good. Everybody's going to want to see it. I need to see it. And as if you didn't know, Zack Snyder's Justice League hits HBO Max on March 18th. Do yourself a favor. Don't look at any of the footage that leaked. Let yourself be surprised at how amazing this director's cut really is. Stop right there. I'm in. So begins the end for Dark Time. I've never seen a being this strong. Maybe one. He's bad. I spent a lot of time trying to divide us. I made a promise to him on his grave. I need to bring us together. There are enemies coming from far away. They serve an old power. This world is divided. No protectors here. No lanterns. No Kryptonium. It will fall in his name. I have turned worlds to dust. All of existence shall be mine. I have a second chance. I am not gonna waste it. He said the age of heroes would never come again. Fighting the devil and his army. You know, I don't care how many demons he's fought and how many hells. He's never fought us united. It's time to stand, fight. The time is now.